Hi, I'm Tim Burks. I am really happy to be here today at this conference and to hear all of your perspectives. Um, I love APIs and I came to that love as an application developer who realized that APIs were the key to making great applications. I think the best thing that you can do with an API is to call it. And as an app developer, I like to call lots of APIs and they were often very different depending on who had made them. I've been on the Apogee team since last October. And before that, I spent a few years at Google helping to lead a team that made client libraries for Google APIs. We did that by writing code generators. And for those code generators to work well, it was really important for our APIs to work in standard ways. If you're familiar with Google, you know that we were already describing our APIs with protocol buffers, which means that lots of our API infrastructure was automatically generated. But even with that, inconsistencies were still a problem. So over the years, we developed internal standards that we made public last year as something we called API improvement proposals. You can find them online at aip.dev and they specify things like standard patterns for working with resources and commonly used features like pagination and retry. But there's still room for improvement. We've noticed that across our teams, sometimes different words are used to describe the same thing, or the same word is used to represent different things. This summer, we had an interesting opportunity to work on this problem. Thanks to the coronavirus, Google had to dramatically change our summer internship program. It would still proceed, but all of our interns were to work remotely and to make cl collaboration simpler, they all would work on open source projects, which also meant that we could easily share their work. So now I'd like to turn things over to Nicole Gizzo. Nicole is a senior at RPI in New York and spent her summer working with us looking at how words are used in open API descriptions of APIs. Thanks for the introduction, Tim. Um, so like Tim said, my name is Nicole Gizzo and for the past summer, I had the incredible opportunity to intern at Google on the Apogee team for the summer. Uh, my intern project was improving API designs with vocabularies and open APIs. Um, so I guess let's jump into it. So what exactly is the vocabulary of an API? This is what our interpretation of what vocabulary for APIs might look like. It's made up of word counts for each of the four types of elements in an API, your parameters, properties, operations, and schemas. And to the right, you can see a snippet of one of our profiles that defines the structure of vocabulary. Vocabulary is made up of word count messages, which hold the word and its frequency of occurrence in an API. The vocabulary message is made up of repeated word counts, one for each element. The purpose of this vocabulary plugin is to build an index of terms that are used throughout a collection of APIs with open API descriptions. So this will yield a collection of field names, which can then be analyzed. So now I can show you an example of the vocabulary output when running it on a sample pet store open API description. Um, on the left, you can see we have our definitions um, and some of the properties of those definitions. So it will pull out error, pet, pets, and properties for those schemas such as code, ID, message, and name. And then on the right, you have some of your operations and the parameters for those operations and it, the vocabulary plugin pulls those out as well. So now that there exists a tool to compile a list of terms used within an API or multiple APIs, what do you do with that data? So in order to analyze this data, um, a suite of operations were created for vocabularies. These were kind of inspired by set operations and if you're a software developer, you may know of these. Um, so the first operation is the union operation, which compiles multiple vocabularies into a single vocabulary uh, intersection creates a new vocabulary containing words that are present in every member of a group of vocabularies. Difference creates a new vocabulary containing words in a vocabulary that aren't present in other. Um, version history creates a version history protocol buffer that highlights the added and deleted terms in each new version of an API. So an example of this output is different than others, but it will be shown shortly. 
Uh, finally, Filter Common creates a list of vocabularies that contains unique words for each API in a group of APIs. And Export to Sheet converts a vocabulary proto buff into a user friendly CSV file that can be displayed in spreadsheets. So, using these operations can reveal some interesting um, insights about APIs when compared to others. So, using the difference operation, you can find the terms that are unique to one API amongst others. And I'll show you some output of using this, um, this function. So when we first started testing this, um, this was at Google. So what better place to start than using Google APIs? Um, so the first thing that we compared is finding the difference of the vocabulary of the Access Content Manager API with all of Google APIs vocabularies. Um, and you can see that there were 33 unique terms found. So that means that custom level, which is a schema, was not found anywhere else um, in Google's vocabulary. Um, some others, access policies and properties was not found, and so on and so on. Um, getting down to here, we tried it with other companies and their APIs as well. Um, so this was Access Analyzer API from Amazon, and we use the difference operator and compared it to every other um, API that Amazon had, which was public. Um, so what's interesting about these results is that common terms such as exist, analyzer, and contains were reported as unique. And that was kind of puzzling to see because you think that these are common terms and they should show up more often and wouldn't be found as unique. Uh, this raised the idea that there might be some consistency issues that can be pointed out using vocabularies. Going back to the slides, um, I'd like to share the results of using the version history operation. Um, so this operation can assist in finding terms that are unique to one API version amongst other versions. Um, so here we have the cloud resource manager, which is an API description of Google's. Um, and this is kind of how the format of this version history operation results in. So you'll see the individual version. So we have V1 beta one, um, and you can see the new terms and the deleted terms from the earlier version, which was just V1. Um, so going from V1 to V1 beta one, there were six new terms. You can see the terms that were created and what category they fall under, such as schemas or properties. And you can also see the deleted terms. So going from V1 to V1, Beta one, there were 43 deleted terms. Um, and you can see all of them. Uh, finally, I'd like to share another operation that was run on the APIs, which is called synonyms. This operation was inspired by the issue raised earlier when reviewing the unique terms in the Amazon API. Um, so the synonym tool will provide you two outputs. First, you'll get a list of terms within the vocabulary that exist in an English dictionary as well as synonyms of those terms, which also reside in the vocabulary. So this is our example output. The first sheet shows a list of terms that exist in the English dictionary. Um, the insightful part though is the second slide, which will um, shows our synonyms that all exist within a company's um, vocabulary. And for this, I was using Google's combined vocabulary. Um, so there are some interesting results such as info and information, um, it marked those as synonyms. Uh, you can also see other outputs such as task uh, exist within Google's vocabulary. And what also existed in Google's vocabulary was project and job. Um, there are some less exciting results <laughs> such as list, uh, listing, tilt, name and number. Um, so to use this, this uh, synonyms tool uses Python's NLTK package and it uses their synonyms package as well. So it's definitely not perfect and the results are far from perfect because of that. Um, but a goal for the future would be to somehow account for the lingo of software engineers when writing these open API descriptions to get better results. Um, awesome. Our solution for these consistency issues was to create a linter for APIs that check for consistency issues when writing API descriptions. This uh, linter is modeled on Google's API linter for protocol buffer based APIs. 
the linter created for this project works directly on open API specifications. Uh, it's built into Google's Gnostic repo as a plugin. Uh, Gnostic is similar to Proto-C. It creates a compiled representation of an API spec that provides strongly typed and validated data structures to API tools. So this results in spending less time parsing and validating JSON. So this linter inspects for compliance with Google's API standards as stated in the AIP guidelines. It also provides suggestions for elements that violate standards. Um, the linter reports are in protobuf format and also JSON format. And I can show you an example of running this linter on one of Google's APIs. The format is it breaks it down to type the message, suggestions if applicable, and the key slash path of where it exists in the API description. So for this example, there was an error because parameter names must follow case convention, and it says lower snake case. Uh, and we are able to provide a suggestion saying you should rename field pretty print, print to pretty underscore print. Um, then we have the path to get there. Um, and one thing that you'll notice is missing is the line number of where this occurs. And this kind of segues into our next topic. Um, so one problem that was encountered was not being able to generate line numbers for the errors. This is because Gnostic's compiled representation doesn't include line numbers, and this problem calls for source info. Proto-C implements a source info option. Um, however, as <laughs> seen in the description on the top of the slide, using this option results in vastly larger descriptors. So when Gnostic was getting built, there were some considerations of adding source info into Gnostic. However, the final decision was not to include source info uh, in order to avoid unnecessary information. So instead of using Proto-C source info, we built our own dynamic solution. This allows you to call for source info on a specific element when you need it, rather than storing source info on every element within the API. Uh, this source info package is built directly into Gnostic and it dynamically retrieves info from an API spec. It uses the Go YAML v3 package and it will return a node. Uh, so this node contains information such as line numbers, uh, column numbers, as well as head and foot comments. Um, and it solves our linting line number problem. So here's an example of running source info. I use the same pet store YAML file and our um, element in question is limit which is a parameter of the list pets operation. So source info will take this file. It'll take the keys, which was provided by the linter. You'll give it a token of what you are trying to find, which is limit. And this is kind of what our output looks like. Um, we see that the line number it will return is 23 and 17. Um, not for this case, just because there wasn't any comments, but it will return comments if there are any you can get the value, which is our name, limit, and the type that it is. So future work. Uh, unfortunately, the internships for Google only last three months, which are just not enough time in the world. So there are definitely some things that, given the chance, or if anybody else would like to continue this work, uh, there's definitely some stuff that needs to be done. Uh, so first, um, I'd like to extend a vocabulary analysis to include not only just open API descriptions, but also discovery and profiles. Um, additionally, like I stated earlier, the synonym scripts needs to be modified in order to account for software engineer lingo. So we can make better, um, better pairs. Um, also, um, so we have kind of all the puzzle pieces that we need. Now we just need to put them together. Um, I'd like to include the vocabulary analysis um, directly into the linter. So then when you're running this linter, in the example that you saw before with info and information getting marked as a synonym, um, it will say info is, been, the frequency of info in your corpus is 90% and information is 10%. Would you like to change this to info to match your company's consistencies? Um, and finally, um, our linter has, I believe, 10 rules at this given moment. Um, I'd like to, if given the chance, add more AIP-based rules just to make a comprehensive winter. Well, and that is all.
Um, thank you, everyone, whoever tuned in. Um, and I guess I can, Tim and I can take any questions now. Okay. Um, so right now there is one question, which is, is this tool open source? I'd like to try running it on my APIs. I think Tim, you'd probably be best to answer this question. Um, yeah, it is. Um, it's still in kind of a raw form because it's a tool that we've been using ourselves, but it's all in the Gnostic repo. So you, you've all found this. I, well, I see Richard posted it in the chat. So it's at, um, it's at the link there, github.com, Google APIs Gnostic. And uh, we'd love to get issues on this. And we're actively working on this and integrating this with other API uh, systems. Um, I'm not sure if Nicole ex directly mentioned this, but we use the open API directory from APIs Guru for our test data. And I uh, just want to acknowledge that that's a great resource for getting lots of APIs to look at. Awesome. Um, okay, I'm seeing another more, not so much a question, but asking to increase the font size. I'm so sorry, I'm just seeing that now. Um, I think these slides will be available after though, and all the links will be available. So you can definitely check out all of our findings on your own. Um, then there is another question saying, can our tool find similar terms such as recommend recommendations to use terms used in other APIs? Um, at this point now, uh, I don't believe it does. It will just find synonyms. Um, but I think a future solution would kind of, just for in terms of finding recommendations uh, of similar terms or even the same terms, would be to go towards a more machine learning approach. Um, just because of NLTK as it is right now, our results aren't perfect. And I think if we move towards that, we'll definitely get better results. Um, yeah, I just want to say that was a bonus thing that Nicole added on her own that was um, really one of the most impressive parts of these results to see that table of synonyms. Um, because I think that's what a lot of us are really after to reduce, um, you know, duplication of terms and to tighten up our vocabularies. There is another question. Have you used this to derive a controlled vocabulary that you will publish somewhere? Um, no, not at this moment, but what do you think, Tim, would something like that ever be done? Like kind of a, a nice def vocabulary or dictionary of yeah. everything. Those are good That's terms. happening. That, that will very likely happen for Google. So we showed this to Luke Sneeringer, who some of you may know from previous conferences. Luke was one of the main drivers of the AIPs, um, not a misspelling. Um, I think Luke coming from the Python community, um, brought PIPs, Python improvement proposals to, a, to APIs, and thus we have AIPs. But Luke looked at this and had a lot of suggestions about things we could do with these terms and has already been trying to reduce manually, like, like a lot of us, like a lot of the teams represented at this conference, manually finding these duplications and, and forcing them out or working to get them out. So yeah, there will be glossaries produced from things like this. And, and at some point, hopefully, we'll be able to help automate that. And this would be like an assistive tool for building your standard glossaries. Um, I'm looking through the, the comments. I'm not seeing any other questions, I don't think. Tim, are you seeing any? Just, just comments, um, but not so much questions. Uh, one thing from, I think I see David's comment at 1143, uh, where David, you mentioned words that are like aggregations, like list of accounts, account list. We didn't break those up, but when we talked with Luke, that was one of the things that we think we would do next is break these, these like camel case words and other compounds into components and, and check those components. I am not seeing any other questions coming in. I guess we can hang out 
wait around okay. for the next eight minutes. Yeah, our contact information is in the slides and mm -hmm. uh, you can reach out to me on Twitter also. So um, thank you for your time. Thanks mm -hmm. for um, sending us interns world and thanks Nicole for coming and joining us and for all this progress that we're all working to make together.